Good morning. It's good to see you all here on this sunny Sunday morning. I don't know about you, but it felt to me like it it got sunny about an hour earlier this morning. I don't know how that happened. So glad that you could make it and that you, at least those of you who are present, remember to turn your clocks forward. So this morning, I'm going to be giving a talk that I've titled Realizing the Self. Um, one of those titles it sounds probably vaguely familiar. We've probably heard things like this before. But I've been teaching the uh, class on the Bendoa, which is uh, A.H. Dogen's, one of his um, great texts. Uh, Dogen is the 13th century Japanese monk that's very important to our tradition, brought Soto practice from China to Japan. And, and the text that I'm teaching, Bendoa, Practicing the Wholehearted Way, is a very important text for Dogen for reasons we go into in the class. And I won't spend too much time talking about this morning because I really just, what was striking me is some of the teachings that we were encountering as we were going through this text. We have uh, Kosho Uchiyama who provides commentary on Dogen's text. He was a teacher from the 20th century in Japan, a very important teacher, very good teacher. And he wrote in his commentary about this practice as being living out the self, which is only the self. And he quotes his teacher, Kodo Suwaki, a very important figure from, uh, from Japan in the 20th century. And he talked about, as Uchiyama says, the self, making the self, into the self. <laughs> or what I remember, the way Sawaki would put it sometimes, it'd be the self selfing the self, you know? And there's something about all those selves that kind of get bunched up that it's kind of amusing. If you know what he's pointing to, there's a lot of depth there. But the difficulty we have is, um, is that word self. I even remember we did a, a study group where we looked at teachings of Kodo Sawaki. It was a collection of teachings that Uchiyama, his student again, had put together. And one of them was something like the self, selfing the self. And people were just like, I can't even handle that. There's all these selves piling up, right? So the question is, when we encounter these teachings, when we have a talk like realizing the self, just what is this self? What is the self that the teachers are pointing to, that the teachings are pointing to? One thing we can say is that when we look at experience, when we just settle into this, there is only this self. That's it. There's only this self that's being pointed to. Now I say that though, and it still leaves us the question, but what is that? What is that? And we think there's an answer for that. What is that self? we really do in our hearts think that there's an answer and we go looking for ourself. You know, I, I, I just remembered uh, there was a quote that uh, I was going to look up today that I forgot, but it just popped into my head right now. So forgive me if I get it a bit wrong. I think it might be so popular. It could be in a bumper sticker now, <laughs> but it's a quote from Pablo Picasso about his art. And he said, I don't seek I find, you know, and uh, there's something about that truth What we do or that self. What we do is we go seeking for it. We don't really just find the self. We go seeking for it. And like I said, it, it's a uh, very, um, it's very poignant for us. It's, it's felt deeply in our hearts. And it has something to do with the fact of what this self is and the fact that we're trying now to understand this self. We're trying to make something out of it. And so now there seems to be something lacking. And so now we got to go find it. What is this thing? So I've been attending some things lately. Just shows. Nothing nothing too sad. Um, but they've just sort of made me reflective, you know, because I've seen virtuosic performing. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what I had always wanted to be. I didn't really have the wherewithal to actually put in the work 
to be a virtuosic performer <laughs> of any kind. But it's certainly something that I had desired. Um, but so, you know, I go to these events and one of them is uh, at the Guthrie Theater right now. And uh, I recommend it if you, if you think you could put up with some clowning on stage. The uh, performer is actually a longtime clown. He's been around for a while. Um, he's not a Guthrie member. He's imported him from New York City. And he's giving a talk. And this will probably, like, some of you will either go, oh, or you're not even going to know what this means. But he's giving a talk on his relationship with the writings of Samuel Beckett. So the show is called On Beckett. And uh, he talks about Beckett, and he talks about clowning, and then he clowns around for all. And I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, my God, this guy knew from a pretty young age. And he'll tell you, he didn't really give you the years, but he was pretty young. It was like Samuel Beckett and clowning and performing, like etched itself into his heart. You know, that's the way it seemed to me. And it etched itself into his heart. And then I encountered these uh, other artists, you know, writers, and I can't even come up with other examples because it just kept coming up. And I, was just, I, I remember telling somebody, I go, you know, I spent my whole life looking for something that was really just going to do that. It was really just going to touch me on the heart like that, like just right. I, I wanted that. I, I felt like I bounced from one thing to another, wanting to have something say, this is it. This is the thing, you know? And, and I know that when I was telling my friend this, it sounds like I feel like I'm pretty lost, mm -hmm. which isn't what I was really saying. It's just that seeing this stuff conjured up some nostalgia Nostalgia's got this pang to it, you know, so the pang was there. And I was thinking about that pang and what it is, the images I had of myself as a young man, as a boy. And so that was it, just kind of reflecting on that. So I was telling somebody else the same thing, you know, another friend who I've known for a long time. And he kind of laughed. He goes, yeah, I still don't know who I am. And, uh, <laughs> and I laughed and I went, you know, that's interesting because it's not how I was putting it exactly. Right? I was just looking for that thing to do, the thing that was going to say, this, I'm it. This is the thing. Here I am. Let's go dancing. You know, it would always be a little more peculiar than that. But then I realized when that person said, I, really, I still don't know who I am. You know, I thought, but that's what I was doing, wasn't it? I was looking for myself. And I was looking for myself in the various, for me, it was art. That was, you know, all different kinds of art that I engaged in. And everything that I tried, I was trying to find myself. And I would really try to make that happen. In odd ways. You know, when I, when I first started doing stand-up comedy, and I think I, well, most of you have done that, had done that for a while. Not terribly professionally. I was a semi-professional for a lot of reasons. Um, but I was funny, you know, and, and I got the attention of club owners and um, what, what have you. Um, but I remember when I first started, I went out on stage, and one of my favorite comedians of all time is Woody Allen. So I'd get out on stage, and I'd start doing a Woody Allen impression. You know, it just was almost unconscious because his timing and the way he phrased things to me was so brilliant. So I was basically doing Woody Allen. And I'll tell you right now, that, that was my first stand-up performance. And it just tanked. <laughs> it was just an, uh, just an utter disaster. Nobody laughed. I think I just sped through this whole thing. And I'd written it like Woody Allen's great stand-up routines, which uh, if you've heard them, they're these long, convoluted stories. They're pretty funny. But nobody wrote stand-up like that in the 1980s. <laughs> it was like something from another era. So I'm sure people just went, what on earth was that? Uh, so I didn't do it for a while again. But, but I felt like that stand-up comedy had asked me to dance with it. So I thought, I got to go back and do this again. So I was also very much moved by the works of Stephen Wright. You know Stephen Wright, 
the deadpan comedian, tell those great lines. One of my favorites is he goes, the other day I was thinking, no, wait a minute, that wasn't me. <laughs> you know, he had just had these deadpan jokes that sometimes you had to play catch up with. And I could write stuff like that, you know? So I started writing that and I, I want to give him a character. And I knew I could kind of do Jim Ignatowski from Taxi. Do you remember him? <laughs> it was a guy that Christopher Lloyd played, you know, and I, I can kind of get up there and do this act. And I didn't know that it was so good that nobody could be in any question about who it was I was doing an impersonation of. And finally, somebody said, why do you get up there and do an impersonation of the guy from Taxi? And I was like, oh, you can tell that who that is. He goes, oh, of course I can. And so it was interesting because I was looking for myself, but I noticed what I was doing. I was looking elsewhere to find myself. And this is the thing that we do. And what we don't realize, of course, while we're doing that, as we're looking for that self, and I think we're looking for what we might think of as our authentic self. As we're doing that, what we don't realize is we're expressing our authentic self right there. Just in the putting on those different hats, just in the being lost and looking around, there we are perfectly expressing ourselves. But we, we lose that. We, we lose sight of the fact that that's, that's us authentically expressing ourselves right there. That's where we are. That's where, that's where our, what do you say, our heart is. That's where our life is, right there, as we're confused, as we're looking for ourself. Right there, we're expressing ourselves, looking for ourselves. And then when I was talking to this person who said, I still don't know who I am, you know, we kind of laughed, you know, and I just went, you know, so I was looking for that thing that branded me on the heart, the thing that really touched me, the thing that said, this is it. And then I thought, is that Zen? Because it hadn't come to my mind that Zen was that. And I had to think about that a little bit, because this is obviously very important for me. And I think it's very important for everyone in this room to some degree or another. And I realized that Zen was not that. Zen was actually the antidote to that. Zen was the antidote to all of that. But even by the time I got to Zen, I was uh, teaching at a community college and I wasn't enjoying it <laughs> very much at all. You know, and I was kind of going, what is going on? Everything I did, it seemed like that was the way it would take. It would be... Uh, Nope. <laughs> a big nope. And what was the nope? Well, I'm looking for myself. It's the, I still don't know who I am. The person who told me that was really talking about the thing, their purpose in life, the thing that they do that makes them who they are. So that self, that self, whatever that self is, the one that we're looking for, that self draws us away from it, distracts us from the self that Uchiyama is pointing out as living out the self, which is only the self, or that Sawaki calls the self, selfing the self. That other self is just a, some kind of idea, and that's why we can't, it can't ever be satisfying. Not only is it an idea, but it's a half-baked idea at best. It's one that we can't really get our hands on. We think we can until it starts to not work right. So, And while I was teaching the most recent Bandoa class, I was reminded of uh, what I thought is a great anecdote about this self that Uchiyama and Sawaki, that the teachings are pointing to when they talk about self. And it's from a uh, text by Dogen. So there, this is a very Dogen heavy talk. <laughs> and I, I might say I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm certainly not, but sometimes Dogen can be a bit, you know. But the stuff that I'm going to be drawing on, for the most part, is not like that. You know, it's pretty straightforward. So this is from his, uh, it's a text called Instructions for the Head Cook. Just Instructions for the Head Cook. And uh, that might sound like a pretty boring thing, you know. Instructions for the head cook. What's he going to do? Tell him to boil the water, start boiling the water. The first thing you get up and then the rice is in the kitchen and the 
firewood is back behind. You know, what is instructions for the cook? The instructions for the head cook is an incredibly profound teaching couched in instructions, practical instructions for this cook. I shouldn't even say it's couched in. It is literally practical instructions for the couch that in its practicality, we start to see what it is that life is. And Dogen, in this, uh, in this particular text, and by the way, you can find this instructions for the head cook or instructions for the Zen cook in a book that is in this edition called How to Cook Your Life. It has commentary by Uchiyama, who I mentioned earlier. And the commentary is brilliant, as Uchiyama's commentary always is. Um, so if you're thinking, oh, I, that thing Steve was talking about, I'd like to read it, you know, look for this book, How to Cook Your Life, if that's what it's called. It's also been called From the Zen Kitchen to Enlightenment or something like that which sounds like a recipe book to me. <laughs> and then I think it has another name. So, um, so, but if you put how to cook your life, I have a feeling you'll be able to find something. But so if you're interested, there's a story that Dogen tells, and we probably all know that Dogen, but in case we don't, just a real quick, just a, like a little proceed, you know, Dogen um, was a uh, precocious um just a precocious kid. He picked up apparently poetry very easily. He's very smart. He understood Buddhist teachings. He, he took to them very well. Um, and he practiced in Japan, but there was something about the practice that wasn't satisfying to him. It just didn't seem like it was getting to the heart of the matter. And one question that arose for Dogen that nobody seemed to uh, answer was, if we're already enlightened as Buddhist teachings teach us. And he had been brought up in the Tendai school, and this is an important tenet in the Tendai school, that we're all already awakened. We're all already enlightened. So he said, if that's true, then why do we practice? <laughs> you know, that's, that's a good question. Why do we sit meditation? Why do we do these studies if we're already enlightened? Somebody asked me a version of that question again just recently. It's a good question. <laughs> it is a good question. What is this about? And taking up this practice can kind of help us to, uh, I don't want to say answer it, but that's what Dogen was doing is he just wasn't satisfied with this practice. And that question was part of that nagging, you know, this, this isn't right. We haven't gotten to it. So he went to China to learn from the Chinese masters and going to China from Japan at that, in that age, in that era was actually pretty risky you know, to cross this sea that was notoriously um, unruly and uh, and people would die on the passage to and from China. So, but he went there with his, his uh, teacher uh, at the time in Japan. And, uh, and I would say that again, Dogen finally comes to a realization in China. And I don't feel like he really answered his question so much as he realized what practice was. And in that way, he answered his question. And it has to do with this living out the self, which is only the self, or the self, selfing self. So the anecdote that I have to tell is when he went to China, some of the figures who impressed him the most, as far as their practice and their understanding went, were Tenzos, and Tenzos are the, the cooks, the head cooks, these cooks that he encountered when he was in China. And I've always appreciated this story, so I'm just going to read to you this section. Dogen writes, when I was in Mount Diandong, a monk called Lu from King Yuan Fu was serving as Tenzo. One day after the noon meal, I was walking to another building within the complex when I noticed Lu drying mushrooms in the sun in front of the Butsudan, which is the Buddha hall. He carried a bamboo stick, but had no hat on his head. The sun's rays beat down so harshly that the tiles along the walk burned one's feet. Lou worked hard and was covered with sweat. I could not help but feel the work was too much of a strain for him. His back was a bow drawn taut. His long eyebrows were crane white. There's the poet and Dogen showing up there. I approached and asked his age. He replied that he was 68 years old. Then I went on to ask him why he never used any assistance. 
He answered, other people are not me. You are right, I said. I can see that your work is the activity of the Buddha Dharma. But why are you working so hard in the scorching sun? He replied, if I do not do it now, when else can I do it? Dogen said, there's nothing else for me to say. As I walked down along the passageway, I began to sense inwardly the true significance of the role of Tenzo. From that exchange. You know, and it's just a, you know, kind of everyday questions. You know, 68-year-old guy back in the 13th century, that was probably a pretty ripe old age. <laughs> and there he was out in the blasting sun. So Dogen said, how come you, you don't use any assistance? And he says, other people are not me. And this gets to the heart, I think, of self again. So when we look at our experience, there's only the self, the self showing up. So who's going to do this? We'll just take a look. But we can say there are all these people out there. But have you ever tried to get somebody to do something? Sometimes it's easy. You just ask them. You just go, could you do this? And they'll go, sure. <laughs> you know, no problem. But what about somebody who doesn't really want to do it? You try to get them to do it. And then maybe you use little techniques like, well, you know, like you do with kids. You try to figure out some way. Well, they're not going to be able to get, if I, if I just directly ask them to do that, they're not going to do it. So let's make a game out of it, you know. So you come up with a game so that the child does the very thing that they would never do in a hundred million years if you called it that, but they'll do it if it's a fun game, especially if there's a reward at the end of it, right? Um, I, I see when I go out walking, I, uh, I really like animals of all kinds. So I love it when I see people walking their dogs and I can't help but go, oh, what a cute dog, you know, and I'm looking at the dog and people are a little protective, more protective about that than I was, uh, than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, you'd actually just go right up and start petting somebody's dog, which I'm not saying is a good thing to do, because what would happen is you'd get bit. <laughs> you know, that was kind of a thing. You know, walk up to the doggy and it would bite you. I remember a chihuahua once biting me right in the palm of my hand, which tells you what I was probably doing to that poor chihuahua, right? And putting that hand on. Um, so now what people do is when they see that somebody's looking at their dog, have you noticed this? They might they make a little clicker sound or something, or they just go for the treats right away. And then the dog pays attention to the owner so that there's not this tendency to maybe get a little too excited. I just, I, I said hi to a dog at the coffee shop recently. It was a big poodle. And it came in and ran right up to me. So I thought, this is my opportunity. I can actually pet this dog. So I asked the owner, I was asking her, is it okay if I pet your dog? And as I started asking the owner this, the dog just went, row, 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 row. and I just thought, oh my goodness. And, and, I, and nobody could calm the dog down. Right? <laughs> so this is the trying to get others to do what you want to do, right? So they got the little treats to try to get the dog from not looking at, you know, and then I'm trying to pet the dog and we're trying to get the dog to be quiet. Actually, the, the little girl told us what the deal was. She said, what's well, his hat? And she pointed at the guy behind the counter and he had a baseball hat on. And, and then to explain it to all of us, because she was a very wise young girl, she said, the dog hates hats. <laughs> 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 but, you know, so we can't really get people to do what we want them to. Right? We can just do, we can just take care of ourselves. And, and, a, and a teaching that you'll hear, too, is watch your own mind. Because we will look at other people and start, I mean, I, I do it way too often. You look at somebody and they're doing something annoying, <laughs> perhaps. And then you you give them a reason why they're doing that. Right? You go, well, they probably, you know, and there you are trying to read their mind, either to excuse it or to condemn it. Like, no person in their right mind would be doing that thing right now. You know, he must be trying to irritate me or, you know, whatever answer you come up with. Watch your own mind. That's really all that's here, right here. Five remembrances ends with the only thing I own are my actions. What are we? What are my actions? Again, what are we talking about there? 
So what is that self? And uh, the other thing that I, that is important in uh, Tenzo's response. So not only other people are not me, right? we're we're responsible for just this that's showing up. Responsible meaning we take care of this. We take care of this. Here it is. We take care of this. Nobody else is going to take care of it. What this is, because what this is is showing up differently to each of us. So each of us take care of this. We each of us, you know, and what we're taking care of is really the whole situation. So we're trying to do, not just take care of our own wants and needs or trying to fulfill what we think somebody else's wants and needs are. Again, if you do that, if you try filling somebody else's needs and wants, you go, oh, they want this. Again, I bet we've all done this. Or you go, I think they want this. And then you start to give it to the person and they get frustrated with you. It might just be help, like assistance or something. Um, and then they're like, I don't want you to do that. Stop, knock that off. Stop fluffing up my pillow or whatever the thing is. You know? So the other thing that he says, though, is, okay, well, then why are you doing it right now? It's a blasting sun. You're an old man. <clears throat> and Atenza says, if I do not do it now, when else? Can I do it? When else do we do things? When we're taking care of things, when we're actually doing things, it's now. It can't be any other time. Now, we live life, again, saying, well, I can't do that right now. I'll do that. I'm Again, I'm a king at that as well. <laughs> well, that thing right there, nah, not, I mean, not right now, because right now I'm drinking a glass of water, so I can't do that thing right now, you know, whatever it is. I'll do it tomorrow. But when you're doing it, you're doing it now. Even when you're not doing it, you're not doing it now, right now. This is the only time that there is. So Uchiyama, when he's talking about living out the self, which is only the self, that quote is actually a little longer. He says, each and every one of us, without exception, is living out the self, which is only the self, and the present, that is only the present. So that self, that is only the self, that's it. Nothing outside of it. It is only the self. That's what this Tenzo is pointing to as well. Living out the self that is only the self, the present that is only the present. That's it. There's only this. This is it. Yeah, Andrew. I was thinking about the self, selfing the self. Yeah. And it's kind of trippy because when I think back to the periods of my life when I was thinking about what, what do I want? What am I going for? I'll put this big elaborate show in my head of thinking about what myself will be in the future. Yeah. But that's me at that exact moment being myself, thinking about myself <laughs> <laughs> for a future self. Yeah. Right. And it's, so it's really bizarre because you could get lost in almost like this weird, what time is it like? I'm thinking about this future self, yeah. but it's the current self thinking about this future self, which, is, which isn't really there anyway. It's weird. <laughs> and, and that, again, is the self expressing the self, but that's not the self selfing the self, even though it sounds like it, because there you are with the self thinking about a self and you're going to do that self. So you're selfing that. So that, but that's the stuff we get caught up in and confused by. So the self selfing the self is not ah I'm going to be you know I'm going to be like uh, I am the kind of person who I don't know I used to wear, wear fedoras all the time I'm the kind of guy who wears a fedora so I'm going to wear a fedora right now you know what I mean like that's not the self selfing well it is the self actually coming up as that person who says I wear fedoras but when we start to think I'm the guy who wears fedoras so I got to wear a fedora right now because that's what I do I'm the guy who wears fedoras that's actually not what Sawaki's pointing to when he's talking about the self, selfing the self. That kind of stuff you're talking about, yeah, you can get all caught up in that. That's the self, selfing the self when the self's not the self, the self, you know, then you can start coming with all these selves. But the self he's talking about is the self that's only the self. That's just this. If we settle into this, we can see what is it that's doing this? Well, we can't really say for sure, but it's sure one thing we can say is it's me. I'm the one who's holding this book right now. Amy's not. Not this book, not right now. I'm holding it. I'm doing it. I'm doing the talking here. <laughs> well, that, I think I've heard people say that to me before. I'm doing the talking here, Steve. <laughs> Pipe down. 
Um, but that self, that selfing the self then is when we come back to the self rather than our ideas about the self, right? those ideas that, oh, I'm the guy who wears a fedora or whatever it is, is in the future, in the, in the year 2000, in the year 2000, I don't know if you've watched Conan O'Brien, but in the year 2000, I will be the guy who drives a, a car with a periscope on it. And this is what I need to do in order to have a car with a periscope on it. I don't know why I thought of a car with a periscope. I don't know if you if you ever uh, watched Curb Your Enthusiasm. Larry David created a, a periscope for when you're driving, so that when you're stuck in traffic, you could put the periscope up and see what's going on ahead of you. Which, of course, is the kind of stuff we do. Uh, what I notice I do is if I'm the passenger and we're stuck, I'm like going as if that's somehow going to make the traffic move. <laughs> oh, what's going on out there? But yeah, that person, that's the future person. That's going to be the person that if I do this stuff now, I'll become that. Look, our, our world works that way. So why did I, why was I not a uh, world-class pianist, which was not something I wanted to be, by the way, you know, but I did want to be Igor Stravinsky, you know, Wow, Igor, I want to compose great music that makes people cringe a little bit. But it's great, but it's great music. And uh, but I had to learn how to play the piano. To, to get my degree, to study composition, I had to have a piano proficiency. So I had to play the piano. And I'd be playing, Mary had a little lamb or something, the equivalent of that, <clears throat> courting with my one hand and playing the melody with another hand. Just something that simple. And it would it would sound like Igor Stravinsky, but it wasn't supposed to. <laughs> you know, it was a, it was a, just supposed to sound like Mary had a little. And I would get so frustrated. And these were these old pianos that were out of tune. And Scott Hall, I started banging on the pianos. It was a piano's fault. And there was somebody had written in pen on one of those pianos, "The piano has been drinking, not me." <laughs> it's Tom Waits' song, sang Tom Waits. Yeah. And I went, it's true, these pianos are junk, you know, and I, I didn't have the patience at the time. So well, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, there are things that we do to, to play the piano. I was going to have to put the hours in, but not the way I was doing it. The way I was doing it, I was just, it was just an exercise in frustration again, because I wanted to be playing the piano. I didn't want to have to go. I didn't want to have to do that dun, 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 over and over again, two hands together. And then ugh, boring. I wanted to play. I didn't want to play Mary Had a Little Lamb, but that was, you know, one of the things we had to play. So I wanted, but I wanted to play. I didn't want to put the work in. So we do have to put the work in in order to achieve goals. We live a life where that's the case. So I'm not at all suggesting that we throw away the way that life shows up. But what I am saying is that that self that we're envisioning, that's not anything other than like a goal that we've created for ourselves. Yeah, I, mean, I know you know that. Um, and that the self, that selfing the self, that self is right here in the piano practicing. That self, can you sit down and play those scales? When I had to, when I got out of college and I needed a job and I, and I, could only realize that all I was as a, a music major and a theater major, the only thing I could do that was going to pay my rent and my student loans was get some kind of day job. And the only thing that I was fit to do was light industrial work. So suddenly I found myself in warehouses. Or one time I was on a drill press all day, just drilling plastic. And let me tell you, here's the deal about plastic. Drills melt it. So to drill plastic, I had to go like a little bit down up, a little bit down up, a little bit down up, a little bit down up. Oh, there you go. Next piece, a little bit down up for eight hours. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, I'm not going to be able to. Make. Again, it's me, right? Look what's going on there. I can't play the piano. I can't do the me. So the next thing I did is I thought I got to get out of the warehouse and into the, like you could see the offices sometimes in some of those jobs. I got to get up there where they are, where the air conditioning is. Uh, I can type about 20, 15 to 20 words a minute. <laughs> and yeah, there's a couple errors in there, you know, but with a little bit of saliva on the end of an eraser, I could get rid of those, uh, those errors. And then with, pen just kind of fill in, <laughs> you know, I mean, it wasn't good. So I had to teach myself how to type. And that's where I started to at least 
settle into the piano exercises I couldn't do and that I was typing. And I really did force myself to just sit. It'd be a beautiful summer day. And I'd be sitting in my office, ASDF, ASDF, you know, typing those, the quick round fox does whatever the quick round fox does, where it uses all the letters. And, and I did all that. And there I didn't quite lose my cool. Sometimes I did, but not, not too bad. But I'm just saying, so it was me that was having this problem um, with just the practice itself. Practicing the piano would be the self, self, and the self. Whatever it is that you're taking care of right now, this is the self that Sawaki and Uchiyama are talking about. Note, I can't define it. It is undefinable, but it's undoubtedly here. Here it is. Again, if I can't do it, who else can? It's not this sense of little self, though. What's interesting to me is that when Dogen resolved what practice is, and our practice is, once again, each and every one of us living out the self, which is only the self, and the present that is only the present. That is what our practice is. That is what Dogen realized. And he realized it when his teacher, let's see, did I write, did I drop this in here? Yeah, I, I, there are a couple different versions of this quote. This is one that I found. So Dogen realized that when, when his teacher in a monastery in China, his name is Ru Jing, when Ru Jing was scolding his sleeping students, the way that this version shows up is he's yelling at one particular student. He says, when you study under a master, you must drop the body and mind. What is the use of single-minded, intense sleeping? <laughs> that was the dropping off body of mind. Body and mind, what we usually associate with self, was the dropping off of that, that Dogen realized was the living out the self, which is only the self. It was dropping off the self, but that little self, the body and mind, the one that we draw boundaries around, the one that we think we know what it is until it gets tested. It's in dropping that off that the self is realized. That almost sounds like a paradox. And whenever we start to encounter paradox, just know what's showing up there is reality teaching you that you got some ideas about things and you're going to have to let that go. Because reality actually isn't paradoxical at all. And this seems paradoxical. So something's going on there. And this is what our practice is, is to realize what that is. We can't tell you what it is, but we can settle into it. We can see it in our practice. One last story. I've taken up about my time. I think I told a few more stories than I intended to. It seems like I always do that nowadays. Or, um, but this is, a, this is a Zen story about a Zen master. And I want to thank Jed for telling me the Zen master's name. I couldn't remember the guy's name. I was like, well, he's the guy who calls out to himself. Jed goes, I think that's Zwickon. And I went, Zwickon? Who's Zwickon? Uh, and that, now I'm settling into the name. I recognize it. But So Zwickon was a Zen master who always used to address himself. Um, now, what I heard is this is what he would say when he would get up in the morning, right? He'd say, Zwickon, he would call. And he would answer, yes, Zwickon. Yes, of course. He was living all alone in the small Zendo. And of course he knew who he was. But sometimes he lost himself. And whenever he lost himself, he would address himself. Zwickon, yes. Yes. Whenever he would lose himself. And when do we lose ourselves? When we lose sight of what our true self is, which is just this. It's when we're not, we're always selfing the self. Again, we're always doing that. But we lose sight of it. And we start to think that the self is something else. And that self always seems to be lacking something. Always seems to have some kind of hole in its heart that needs to be filled. To be confused about this, this, just this, whatever this is. To be confused about this is to be confused about the self, is to live your life as if it were somewhere else. That's what you were talking about. When we're confused about this, confused about the self, and then it's as if we're living our life as if it were somewhere else. And we miss out on life. And we only have 
that much in a cosmic scheme of things. That's even too long, you know? Anything I could do, too long. It's such a brief period. But we don't know where the end is. It could even be briefer than we think it's going to be. It's really just moment to moment. The duration we have, every moment, it's gone. Every moment, here it is. Every moment, it's gone. Here it is. It's gone. It's here. It is. That's how it's showing up for us, every moment. So if we live as if life is happening somewhere else, every moment we're missing life. So that is my talk. If anyone has observations, comments, or questions, I'd be open for those. I wanted to follow up on that previous observation. Maybe I didn't quite express what I was trying to express, but like this morning when I was sitting Zazen, um, I had a similar thought where I can see my mind as kind of thinking, racing, formulating, things are happening. That is happening. And then there's this awareness of, oh, I'm doing that. I need to come back. But I'm like, but I'm already here. This is exactly where I am right now. That's just part of what's happening right now. Yeah. But there's that thing where I think we always want to put some sort of special uh, little dollop on top of what, what the real thing is, right? Yeah. I want to really be sitting in a nice Zazen right now. Yeah. Uh, but that's just thoughts of what you would like to see happen and what's actually happening is i'm sitting there with my mind thinking about how i wish i was doing more zazen when i'm doing zazen yeah <laughs> that's right that's right yeah no that's perfect but but that has that future self kind of built into it because because of what you were saying too that once it starts getting curlicued you know once it starts being like uh uh here i am watching myself in zazen um that kind of self-consciousness that we're narrating, obviously, now we've got another person doing something impossible, which is sort of watching yourself as an object. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I appreciate the clarification because that, that's what we do. We'll, we'll take just the observation that uh, here I am daydreaming or here I am. And just realizing that is enough, but we put that extra thing in there. And it might be, and I shouldn't be doing that or... Um, and now here I am observing the fact that I'm noticed that I'm, oh, and here I am observing the fact that I'm observing the fact that, and all that is that little self kind of stuff. It's all that stuff where we're trying to, it's, it's like trying to pin now down. You've seen me do that before too, you know, all right, I'm going to say now when it's now, right now. Nope. That was too late. All right now. No, nope, that was too late. Every time you say now, it's going to be too late. And the same thing with that self. Every time it starts saying, well, here I am, I'm observing myself, you know. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> That's how it's really showing up. So as long as you're doing that, then it's going to be like when I was a kid, my mom would take us to every fall to go shopping for school clothes. You know, so I remember going to a place called Treasure Island. It, it wasn't a casino. It was actually a clothing store. And it might have been like, less expensive clothing store, I have a feeling, based on the shoe stores we went to. Uh, but uh, what the best part of going to Treasure Island for me is when you went into the dressing rooms, there were two mirrors right across from each other. Do you know what I'm talking about? Wow, where's that going? You know, and I'm trying to get out of the way because I can see as far down into those mirrors as possible. Yeah, but there we are sticking our head in the way, right, going, ah, uh, you know, can I see the reflection of the reflection of the reflection? It's kind of like that. And it'll never end. It's like those mirror reflections just kind of going off into never, never land. And that's what our self does. Because what we've done is those mirror frames, there's frames. We can see the mirrors reflecting themselves into eternity or as far as we can see, actually. Um, but reality is actually the boundarylessness that perhaps we're sensing when we see that. I know as a kid, it would give me a funny feeling. <laughs> just like a, there'd be a funny feeling I would feel when I would see that. But then I, I would immediately think about all the frames that were on it. And that would be part of the way I would understand it. Just like, yeah, I'm observing myself, but now I'm observing myself. Observing, now I'm observing myself, observing myself, observing it. Now I'm observing myself. Yeah. Woo! Dropping away of body and mind. <laughs> That's the realization rather than hanging on to it. Yeah, Mary. Mary. 
that sense of of observing oneself in zazen, I noticed it and it felt like a trap. But then one day, noticing, I'm observed, uh, noticing just observing. Yeah. And then in the next moment, there was a sound. Uh, maybe the building creaked, like the build, like it creaks, the walls creak in here, or a bird sang, or, and immediately, that sense of observing the self was gone. As Dogen says, emptied in an instant, vanished in a flash, gone. Yeah. That was so helpful yeah. because it showed to me that it has no substance whatsoever. Yeah. None, which is so incredibly helpful. Yeah. Because what's happening is just observing. But but again, with the kind of what something apart from the action. That's right. Observe. That's right. That it's just. That's all it is. And what we do then is we put observing ourselves in there, even if we don't do it like putting a label on it. It's just a sense we have that we're watching ourselves. And that sound of the birds or whatever is really just bringing us back. It's like that story I told about the guy I know who was looking at the beautiful sunset. And he was like, oh, I'm at one with the sunset. This is just so incredible. And then a carp splashed in front of him. And he was like, oh, it ruined my oneness with the sunset. And I said, no, the carp brought you right back to reality. <laughs> you were caught in your daydream. And same thing when we have this sense that we're observing ourselves, we're still kind of caught up in that daydream. So the birds can help break us out of that and really just see the, the observation is really just you know, this objectless and so subjectless uh, awareness. Yeah. But th yeah, thank you for sharing. Any other questions or observations? All right, well, I just remind you all, we have our annual meeting after this, which will be happening in about 10 minutes. I, I did push us a little close, I could have Shaved about five minutes off my talk, I think. But we've got about 10 minutes. We'll be meeting down in the classroom. I invite you all to participate. Um, we will be kind of going over where Dharma Field's been in the past year, where we're going to be going in the next year. And we will also be uh, voting in our new board members. So hopefully we'll see you down there. I know there are treats and tea and coffee down there as well. So those of you on Zoom, you just want to hang on. We're just going to keep the feed going and uh, re- locate you in the basement. Are we going to do it live camera -y, like Saturday Night Live, where they can see you moving down into the basement? <laughs> All right. But you, if you just hang on, stay there, we'll, we'll be right back. So thank you. Thank you.